Praise God for the heartfelt, spirit-led prayer of our sister. And so, yes, you see the, the theme or the title for today's sermon, Praying for Revival. So it's fitting that we had such a prayer that was given to us. Um, I'm excited, and I think God is moving. Well, I, I know he is. I pray he continues to. So we're going to uh, be in Exodus chapter 33. Uh, we're going to read verses 12 through 17 today. So we are continuing in the section that we began a couple weeks ago. We see this progression that has taken place after the Israelites' sin and disobedience and God's anger with them. And then we see how Moses and some others intercede and to seek after the Lord. Last week we talked about how they pitched the tent outside the camp. And uh, after they were seeking the Lord for a while, God's presence, seen through the pillar of cloud, returned and stood at the entrance of the tent. And then the people, even though they had been disobedient and sinful, they stood and they worshiped the Lord. Their hearts were warm. So we see God's movement there. That's where we left off last week. And I also want to just uh, praise God and say, give thanks that uh, the VBS or some people from VBS, actually one teacher in particular, wanted to have these prayer times before VBS. And so they said, hey, let's pitch a tent on Sundays, and let's pray for VBS. And you know, with VBS, there's a lot of things going on, and praise God, and thank you, those who help with decorations. I know you guys did things yesterday. It's a lot of work, preparation. Uh, so there's a lot of hands and a lot of volunteers, and we always give thanks to God for that. And I know that there's prayer going on, but in the history of our VBS, at least the last several years, there's been no like concerted prayer in the sense of, hey, let's have prayer meetings before VBS. I'm sure it's happening in terms of individually here and there, but for someone to say, hey, no, there's a lot to do, but we must seek the Lord. We must ask for his presence in this VBS. Praise God to that. And that was actually a prayer of mine that I've had in the last several years as well, hoping that someone else would. I didn't want to do it and say, like, hey, you guys should do this. But it, it just happened. And so praise God. So I do pray that you guys would uh, join into that too, especially if you're parents as well, and your kids will be participating. That's one way for you to really bless this VBS. Okay, so we are in Exodus 33, and we're going to read verses 12 through 17. So this is after Moses pitched the tent outside the camp, and him and some others were seeking the Lord. So we read in verse 12 of chapter 33, the word of the Lord says, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight... Please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to me, and, I'm sorry, and he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Amen. Word of the Lord. Let me pray. Lord, as we continue this series on revival, Lord, I know that it may not seem relevant to everyone, at least not when we talk about revivals historically, but I do pray that in the heart of anyone who knows you, first of all, who belongs to you, this would be very relevant because it's the deepest longing of our lives, that we want more of you, we want to be closer to you, we want our hearts to be made alive all the more in you. And we also want that for those who don't know you as well. So Lord, continue to enlarge our hearts and open our eyes and help us seek you. And today as we talk about praying for revival through Moses' example, may we learn how to pray what to pray for, or why we pray. And then may that lead to actual you know, revival, reviving in our own hearts as well as in our body and even unto the city and the nations, Lord. You've done it before. Do it again. So cover me. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Thank you, and in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So yes, so last week we saw in this previous passage how a tet had been pitched, and you could maybe argue that things were back to normal, uh, normal being really good for the Israelites, because God's presence was amongst his people again. The cloud returned. Right? Uh, the people were worshiping God. So that's good. Uh, and 
I think maybe Moses and even the people at that point, and I think I certainly might have done this, okay, God, I'm satisfied. I know that we had sinned against you, and we had sinned heinously, and you were angry, but we pitched the tent, we repented, we stripped off our ornaments, and now your presence is back. So let's keep going on. Life is, quote, unquote, normal. And I think I certainly would be satisfied because if God was doing that on a weekly basis where we sensed his presence and people were truly worshiping, then I might be satisfied with that. That's not always the normal in most churches as well. But what we see here, though, is that Moses is not satisfied. Most of us would be probably, but Moses is not. He's not okay with things coming back to normal and even the the pillar of cloud being there. He wants more. He wants more of God's presence. He wants more assurance. He wants more of God's power. And so we see how he prays, how he prays. We know that they pitch the tent and they're seeking the Lord, but we don't have any clue up to that point, verse 11, of how Moses prayed, what he prayed for. But in verse 12 through 17 and, and a little bit uh, further, we see, we hear how Moses prays. And this is going to help us understand what praying for revival looks like, what we should pray for, uh, why we should pray, and how we should pray. All right? um, so we'll see these things. And one thing that I want you guys to also notice is, in terms of your own prayer lives, however little or much that may be, I think all of us will probably feel this disconnect in the sense that we don't ordinarily pray this way. Most of us don't ordinarily pray this way, even if we do pray. And so there's a lot to learn and be challenged by. And then we want to ask ourselves this. What if we did pray this way? What if we did pray like Moses prayed? What might God do? What might happen? Not just individually, but of course corporately as well as his people. And so I just mentioned that, but this, this passage will teach us these things about praying for revival and prayer. What we should pray for in revival, why we should uh, pray for, or the why of why we should pray for revival, and then how we should pray for revival. So let's look at that first one. What should we pray for in revival? What should we pray for in revival? What does Moses specifically pray for? He asks God for a few things. First, he asks for God's assurance. And then we see him asking for more of God's power. And then we see him asking that God's people would be distinct. So let's take that first one. Moses first asks God for more assurance. Now go back to verse 11 for a moment. And we read this. It says that um, after they pitched the tent and Moses is there along with some others who are seeking the Lord. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now, Jun Suk mentioned in praise time that it's true. We can't see God face to face. None of us would be able to survive because of his holiness. But there is this sense that Moses' closeness with God was such as this, was like this, like a man speaks to his friend. So Moses had this communion, this intimacy with God before he praised this in verses 12 through 17. He had experienced this kind of closeness, or another way to put it is this assurance of God's presence in his life. So the first thing that I say uh, or I look at when, God, when he's asking for more of God's assurance is, Moses, you already were experiencing this. I mean, far more than I ever had in my life or most people ever have. And you're asking for more? Aren't you being a little selfish? Aren't you being a little bit greedy? But he's not. He understands God's heart. And he also understands the need for this assurance. So he says in verses 12, uh, the middle of verse 12 and 13, Yet you have said, I know you by name. This is what God has said to him. I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I, may know, I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. It's, it's a little confusing. It's a little circular, perhaps. But Moses is saying to God, if I have found favor before you, which God says he has, then give me an assurance of your presence and your ways, so that I can know you more and receive more favor before you. So Moses is saying, yes, I've received favor, and yet he's asking for more favor. Again, it sounds like Moses is being greedy. Is it greedy to ask for more of God? Is it greedy to ask for more than his ordinary presence? Is it greedy to ask for more of his spirit to be poured out? Those are all rhetorical questions. And the answer is no, it's not. It's not. And we see that. 
we ought to, we can ask God to give more and to show more of himself. We need this assurance as well. So, you know, personally, let me just say, as we're going through this series and we're asking God to revive his people. So as a pastor, I'm asking that God revive your people, revive this church, revive the individuals, revive us corporately, revive and bring to life those who may not know you even truly, right? Save those. There is this need for God's assurance because my faith fluctuates. And preaching about something like revival, first of all, I know that I can't do it myself. God has to do it. God has to pour out more of his spirit. God has to give more of his presence. So I need this assurance personally that, God, you know me. I know your presence. So even on that level, my prayer has been, Lord, as I preach, before I preach these things, before, you know, as we're going through this series, please give me the assurance that you are with me. Because if you're not with me, I don't sense that you're with me. How can I preach to others that God's presence wants to be with us, that God's presence will be with us? And so that's been my heartfelt prayer. God, assure me first. And then, you know, I've read other things, and this really challenged me, too. I shared with some, a few people, but, you know, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, uh, he, at times in his life, would experience the assurance of God's love so strongly, so powerfully, that... At the nighttime, you know, when he was praying and ending maybe his day with prayers and in God's presence, God's love would sometimes be so strong that he would tell God, God, can you please stop giving me your love? Can you stop pouring out this assurance of your love and your presence? Because I got to go to sleep, Lord. You know, this is keeping me up. I mean, that would be great to have that keep you up. But he literally would say, stop, Lord, enough. Your love, you've been pouring out your love too much. How many of us have experienced that? I've experienced some encounters where I do sense God's presence and his love. I've, I've shared this before. It's kind of like waves of his love, and it's so powerful, and I'm so thankful. But I can probably, on both hands, tell you about how many experiences I've had in my life like that. And so for me, even in my thinking, I'm thinking, God doesn't ordinarily do that. But then Moses and someone like Spurgeon would say, no, God has this immeasurable greatness of his love. God has more resources than we could ever imagine. And you don't think he pours it out upon his people? So to pray and to ask for this assurance is something we ought to do, something we should do. Many of you in your Christian life, you struggle with a lack of confidence and courage in the Lord. You lack this assurance. You know, sometimes it may be because you start, you're, sin, you're in sin and you're in rebellion, things. but a lot of times it's just like, God, I'm not sure that you really love me. And again, I can't do this, you can't do this on yourself, but when we do ask God for this assurance, God does give it, right? Even after God had revealed himself to Moses in these amazing ways, Moses still asked for more, and God does assure him. God gives him more assurance. So that's the first thing that we ought to pray for, God's assurance that he is at work, that his presence is real, that he's doing these things. And then Moses also asked for more of God's power, for more of God's power. He must know that God will go with them because he's afraid of what will happen without him. So on one level, Moses is very aware of his own weakness. And you know the thing about Moses, which is really important, and maybe you guys heard this before or you read this about him, but we read, um, I'm not sure which book it's in, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, or Numbers, but uh, we read about, or maybe even Deuteronomy, sorry, uh, but we read about how Moses was the meekest man on the earth. That was his superpower, his humility and his meekness. I know for most of us, especially in our culture, we don't see those things as strength, but that was Moses' strength. That was his superpower. And because of that, or as a result of that, he knew his weakness very well. And so he was always dependent on God's power in his life. He knew he needed it. As a leader, he knew that. He felt that. And so that's why he's asking God this in his prayer. Lord, we need more of your power. I need more of your power. God. I'm weak apart from you. And then he also knew that the Israelites as a people, they were so fickle. And they could become so hard-hearted and rebellious. We need, your people need your power, God. Without you, we're doomed. Yeah, you can send an angel, but that's not enough. You need to rule over us. And so he asks as he prays for more of God's power in him as well as God's people. You know, another confession, 
Um, in terms of my life, you know, as when I was younger, when I would preach, uh, definitely I had this insecurity. Right? Uh, I still have to fight that too. But this insecurity was more rooted in wanting to please man in some way. I may have not shown it, but in my heart, I'm thinking like, oh, people like what I said. You know, were they, were they engaged? You know, all these thoughts. Um, and so it was performative in the sense that just like uh, maybe more so for a comedian or for an entertainer, whenever they go up and perform, there is this sense of like fear and maybe even like an imposter syndrome. Like, can I really do what people expect me to do? I still have that imposter syndrome, but it's different. It's not because what will other people think of me. It's because I'm tasked with sharing something so glorious, something so precious, the gospel, the word of God. How could I do that? in my state, in my condition, as a mere man. How can I do it? So I'm afraid each week because I'm like, Lord, if you're not with me, if your power is not with me, what do I have to give? I, I don't have that on my own. And so there is that tension every week. I'm like, I'm coming up and I'm being an imposter in some ways. I'm not being hypocritical. I'm trying to be true and genuine. I'm not saying that. But it's like, God, if you don't show up, if your power is not present, then I have nothing to really say of any value. That's what Moses was saying. We're doomed unless your power is not with us. And so he asked for more of God's power. And then he also asked that God's people, the Israelites, would be distinct. How will the other nations, how will all the other people on the face of the earth know that we're your people unless we're distinct, unless you're with us, unless people see that, evidence of that? And so there should be signs, there should be things that distinguish them, and that comes from God's presence. And so he also asked that God's people would be distinct. You know that the church is not meant to look like the world and to act like the world. It doesn't mean we should be self-righteous. It should, doesn't mean we should have our nose in the air and say, oh, you guys, look at you sinners. But it also doesn't mean that we should be just like the world. We should act and behave like the world. We should do the same things that the world does. No, the church should not. The church always needs to be distinct. And so when we're praying for revival, we're praying that God's people would be God's people, truly. That there'll be a distinction. And that comes from God's presence working in their midst. When the church is revived, when it's awakened, when it's no longer a sleeping giant, the power of God is actively at work in the church, then the world will see that and people will be drawn for the right reasons, for the right reasons. Not because I'm going to a church and it looks like a nightclub. I went out on Saturday and look, I get to go to a church on Sunday. That's like, that's not how we're distinct. That's not how we're different. I know people have done that in the name of relevance. But what does that create? That creates Christians who are just like the world. There's nothing different about them. There's no power of God. There's no distinction of God in their midst. Right? But when the church is the church, outsiders will be drawn because they'll see something different. Uh, I heard this. It was, it was about a local church, and someone was just making a comment about what can happen at just any church down the street. But let's say there's a church, a local church, and someone in that church is having an affair. But they're still singing in the choir. So everyone knows it. People in the church know it. Even outside the church, they know that there's this individual having an affair in that right now, but they're still singing in the choir. Immediately, you know what happens to that church? They have no witness. They have no power. Right? Now, I'm not saying sin can't be in the church. That's not what I'm saying. But if a church is like, oh, it's okay for that person to continue to serve, or we're just going to ignore it, or it doesn't really matter, the church has no witness. The church has no distinction. The church has no power. Okay? And so he prays, would the church be distinct because you are with it and you are working? So those are some things that Moses prays for and we should pray for when we pray for revival. We're asking for more assurance. We're asking for more of his power. We're asking that his people would be distinct. Now, why should we pray? Why should we pray for revival? There's three things as well, and these should, they're all connected in some ways. But for the sake of God's glory, we should, that's the re one big reason or the main reason why we should pray for revival. And then for the sake of Christ's church and for the sake of the nations. So... First of all, you should see, if you guys read your Bibles, and if you haven't uh, very closely, then just do that, especially when you're reading through the whole Bible. But we see how a primary motivation for God to work in this world is so that his glory would be filled, uh, so that his glory would fill the earth. Right? The whole earth would be filled with his glory. 
And so why we pray for revival, why we pray for more of God's presence, firstly, is we want his glory to fill the earth. We want his glory to fill the earth. Every week when you come and you gather here on Sundays, okay, for me as a pastor, yes, you can have community, you can have connections with people, but I know that what the church and what God's people primarily need to desire or want is that God would be glorified in us, as people individually as well as corporately. Right? And that should be the burning desire in us. We're praying, we're asking for God to be glorified, right? that God would be seen more clearly. And then we also pray, another reason why we pray is for the sake of Christ's church, for the sake of Christ's church. We want Jesus' glory to be in his church. And like I said, we desire his church to really be his church, to act like it, to live like it, to, to be it. Uh, I, I, I quite often borrow that uh, phrase from Martin Lloyd-Jones, who, and I, I've mentioned he preached a lot on revivals, and I've learned a lot, and I'm sharing some things that you know, he would share too. But he would say that the church is the church, or what makes the church the church is the presence of the glory and power of God. He'd always say that. That's what makes the church the church. You know, you can have people gather. You can have community. You can have connections, and those are all good things. But if that's all that the church is, it's not distinct. It's not based on God's presence and God's glory. Right? You remove God's presence and God's glory, you can have the strongest fellowship in the world, but that's not truly the church. You can do a lot of social things, but that's not truly the church. It's rooted in Jesus and what he's done and his presence in the midst of the church. Um, and so we desire that. You know, I shared on Wednesday at our uh, Wednesday prayer meeting, I shared a little part of my personal prayer list when I pray for our church. It's a general thing, but it's really meaningful for me. And one of the things I pray for is that Christ's glory would be in our church. And I also added that our church would not be casual or flippant. Flippant means there's a lack of seriousness, okay? that we wouldn't do that. And so let me, let me take a moment, okay, yeah, that you guys might feel like, oh, I'm not being legalistic. You guys know, some of you who have been a long time, we've always had problems with people coming on time to church. So we even made some rhyme, like, I forget, I, I don't know what it was, but we, we would make some rhyme or something to try to get people to come in. This was, mind you, when we used to meet at like 1 or 1.30, and people were still 30 minutes late to church. That still happens, though. I know there's reasons. I, I, I get that there are reasons, especially those of you who have family and maybe harder. But you understand that posture reflects there's somewhat of a casualness how we, to how we approach right? God's presence, how we step into that place. Another thing, and I don't want to be too long on these things. Uh, I don't mean to condemn us, but another thing that I've noticed before, and I've mentioned this, and I'm not against Starbucks or things like that, but like sometimes when after the service is going, I'd walk through and then I see a latte here on the side or this and that. And I'm like, why are people bringing lattes into this sanctuary? Again, we don't have any rule. We've never mentioned that. But I think it's a posture thing. It's like, I'm just going to be casual. Well, I'm here. I'm late, five minutes late. What's the big deal? I got my latte. I'm going to stroll on. I'm just going to sit back and let's sing. Is the singing OK? Or well, what's he going to say? Uh, I don't want to pay attention to that. I'll be on my phone. There's this casualness. Christ's glory in his church causes people to get a sense that there's a weightiness as we're gathered here. As we're worshiping, as we're listening to God's word, it's not just like, I got to do this for an hour or whatever, and then, you know, I get to do, again, whatever I really want to do. No, no. Christ's glory needs to return, even in that manner, in the midst of his people. Okay? And so we pray, that's why we pray, that Christ's glory would be preeminent in the midst of his people. And then another, the last reason of why we pray for revival is for the sake of the nations. It's for the sake of the nations. So we pray for revival, as Moses is saying, like, if we're your people and we're not distinct, how will all the other people on the face of the earth even know you, God? It's not just for them. He's also saying, God, how would they know you if your people, the people who are called by your name, if they're no different, you're not with them, how will other people know you? And you know that every time God has brought revival in places, it's always spread. There's always others who have come to know Christ as a result. The lost come to him. You know, Pentecost, Acts 2, when the church was birthed, how many were saved on that day after Peter preached? 3,000. 
And you guys know, maybe you didn't know this, but that, that um, festival, that feast of Pentecost was a very big thing amongst Jews. So you had Jews from a lot of other nations. There were still Jewish people, but they were from other nations who all gathered in Jerusalem during that week. God strategically and purposely sent his spirit then. Why? Because what happened after those 3,000 became saved? They didn't stay in Jerusalem, a lot of them. They went back to their own homes, their own countries. The gospel spread. More people were saved. Right? God does that. When we see revival historically, we see even how revival spread from nation to nation. We're going to talk about the revival in 1857 and 58, which Isaac also mentioned. That was a uh, reason why we do the Zoom prayers. Uh, but that went from America, and then it went to Wales in Europe. Um, the 1904 revivals that we've talked about, some in Korea, for example, um, that spread to, it, it, uh, there was revival in America during that time too, in some uh, areas of America. Last week we talked about how it spread to India some. There are people in India who had heard about revival. But what you see that happened oftentimes in these times of revival in a country, in an area, other people would hear about it, and mind you, they had no email, they had no social media. They did have some newspapers back then, but word traveled a lot more slow. But they would catch wind that something was going on, and so people would go to those countries, those nations, and they would see what was going on, and then what would happen? Something, God would do something in them, give more faith, they would go back to their country, and then revival would spread. So in Korea, it's interesting, one missionary, he heard about the revival in Korea, he was from China, a man named Goforth. He went to Korea, traveled there. He experienced revival. He saw it with his own eyes. You know, it's like the honey thing. The Bible says we don't just think about honey. We don't learn about honey. You have to taste and see that honey is good. You have to taste it. He went. He tasted revival. He saw it. Then he went back to China. And uh, several years after that, revival began to happen in China. But that's what God does. And it's for the sake of the nations. Why do Christians seek to go to the ends of the earth? So people from all tribes, tongues, and nations will, be, will hear the gospel and save, and ultimately so that the whole earth will be filled with his glory. Right? So we pray for revival for the sake of the nations and God's glory, going to every nation, every people, every corner of the world. Okay. Okay. Lastly then, how should we pray for revival? How should we pray for revival? Well, we see in Moses that he prayed with boldness, he was even willing to argue with God, and he was persistent, and he was persistent. He kept back, coming back to the same thing, God's presence. But let's talk about boldness for a minute. You know, praying for revival isn't casual or mild, nor should prayer be in general. I know sometimes we do give out weak prayers. I do that. Uh, I've fallen asleep when I pray, true confession. Okay? So I know that we don't always pray with that kind of energy or boldness. But we ought to. Um, and what that means more than anything is that we are bold before God. And we see this in Moses. He keeps going back to God and saying, are you going to go with us or not? You know, he didn't assume that just because the pillar came back and the cloud came back, that that meant God was going to go with them. Because remember in verse 1 through you know, 4, God says, hey, you guys go to the promised land. I'm going to send my angel. I'm not going to go with you. And the people respond correctly by saying, by repenting and being like, that's the worst news we could ever hear. Even if you give us your blessings, if you're not with us, then we don't want to go. So they responded rightly. But after God returns, his cloud returns because the tent is pitched, they could have assumed, Moses could assume then, oh, that must mean that God's going to go with us. But that's not good enough for Moses. So he's like, Mo uh, God, you need to tell me, are you going to go with us or not? And he's so bold in that. He keeps asking God again and again and again. Right? I've said this about my sons, and one more than the other, but I won't say who. But, you know, one thing that maybe I like as a certain sense, but I really don't, is that when they would ask for something, if I said no or said, uh, they would just go, okay. But part of me was like, ask again. Right? Bother me again. Be bold. Say and I may say at the sense, because I just, that's wrong or that's bad, but it's like, you're giving up too easily. Don't do that, right? And many of us, we give up too easily when it comes to coming before the Lord. Because there is a sense that God is seeing, do we really want this? Do we really want him? Asking once is not enough. Okay? You know, I've shared this. Yeah, I mean, you see that. But so this boldness, this continual coming, 
and even persistence, which we'll get to in a moment. But we also see that God is willing, or Moses is willing to argue with God. He's, and I put argue in parentheses and quotes because, you know, oh, we're not supposed to argue with God. But you see this sense of arguing. And what does he do to argue with God, quote unquote argue? He brings up what God has said. God, you say that you know me. You say that I'm known by name. You say these things. Then you must go with me, God. Like, you said it. You better do it. You say that these are your people. Then you need to go with your people. But notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't argue with God based on his own merit. He doesn't say, oh, look at the Israelites. They repented. They stripped off their ornaments. You know, look at all the things that we're doing now. He doesn't bring any of those things to justify him or the people before God. He brings God's word, God's promises, and he argues with God in that sense. Some of us, let me, let me give you a quick example of how even extreme this could be. Some of you, maybe if you're in sin or you've committed sin and you feel very far from God, most of you, most of us, our natural tendency is to say, like, I can't approach God because of what I've done. I just, I can't. I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. And we should feel some shame. We should because we've sinned against God. But you're not going to get back into God's good grace or be in his presence because you fixed that, because you've changed that. Yes, repentance is required, meaning like, God, we're turning to you. But the basis of why we could approach God is entirely what Jesus has already done for you. So you can be bold about that. You could even technically say, I'm not saying we should, like you commit, you know, Lord, last night I know I got drunk, but I'm coming to you today, approaching your throne of grace because of what Jesus has done for me. Yes, I've sinned against you, but I also have confidence, and I could even be bold before you in saying, God, receive me into your presence. Let me be in your presence because of your son, because I trust and believe in your son. We can be that bold. We can even argue with God in that way, based on what he's done. And a people that know how to pray for revival, people that know how to really try to get a hold of God, they get that. And they pray in that manner. And they also pray with persistence. They pray with persistence. What is Moses' central desire? He keeps circling back again and again. It's God's presence. God, if you don't go with us, we're doomed. If you don't go with us, we don't want to go. He keeps coming back to that again and again and again. And that's at the heart of how we pray for revival. At the end of the day, we want his presence. That's what we want most of all. Now, let me just close by uh, giving an example. We've been doing this each week to some degree about revivals in history. I mentioned that briefly, but in 1857 and 58, there was a revival that some call the businessmen revival. And I'll explain why in a moment. But it's also known by some as being the third great awakening in America. You had the first and the second. So some people don't consider this the third because it's lesser or it's considered lesser. But that's another title that some use. But I actually prefer this title, how it's referred to. It's also called by some as the prayer meeting revival, prayer meeting revival. Um, And so, you know, our Zoom prayer meeting, lunchtime prayer, it actually came because of this. I'd read about it and I was like, okay, let's pitch a tent then, you know, during the day and let's meet to pray. But it happened actually outside the church, outside the camp, too. It happened um, in the first, first prayer meeting at that time was in New York, and it was near Wall Street. And I've shared this before some, too. Maybe some of you are familiar. But it was, near, uh, it was on Fulton Street, but very close to Wall Street. And the main person in this revival, or the most famous, was this guy named Jeremiah Lanfear. He was actually not a pastor, but he was a local city missionary, and he had been a businessman prior to this for like 20 years. So he knew business. He had a heart for businessmen. And so he was trying to evangelize the businessmen in the city, but then it dawned on him, and you know, I, I believe God gave him this direction. He said, why don't you start a prayer meeting, noontime prayer meeting, for businessmen in the city? And at that time, too, maybe about a month before that, the stock market had crashed. And so businessmen perhaps were softer, maybe a little bit more open, right? There was, there was more of an urgency. Well, the first time they met, and it was weekly at first, the first time they met, six people came, and no one was there for the first half hour, so it didn't start out great. But then the next week, 20 came, and then the following week, 30, and they continued to grow, and then it became daily. But the thing about this, some of the things about this revival was, first, it was rooted in prayer, for sure. I mean, that's what people were doing. And so other prayer meetings began to sprout out throughout the city. 
But another interesting thing about this revival, which was great, and this is how God works too at times, is that there were people from every circle of life, and in particular, when it came to Christians, like people from all different types of denominations, because it didn't happen in a particular church, like a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church. So people, businessmen that were showing up to this meeting, they came from all different types of churches, different theological backgrounds. They worship Jesus, they love Jesus, but there's a lot of differences. And yet this prayer meeting, this revival, united people. And because there was also newspaper coverage, because this happened initially in major cities, word did spread. But even with this, another thing was interesting, the favor that this revival had with the outside world, with media, with people around, no one was ostracized or or speaking badly about this. No one was saying, oh, that's fake or they're suspicious. There was this favor. And part of the reason was because there was this unity that was coming through these gatherings of prayer. And this spread to major cities. It spread to Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago. It actually spread all the way to the West Coast in those two years, 1857 to 58. It hit um, college campuses. It affected Sunday schools. Um, You know, the the song, Jesus Loves You, you know, that was actually penned by this woman, Anna Winter, I think. I'm not sure what her name is. Uh, But that happened during the revival because there were so many young kids. So it was generational as well. And it was all rooted and built on prayer. And even classes too, poor, black, white, rich, those, all these people started coming together as a result. God was working in this way. Okay? Powerful. Now, I mentioned that it was a no-name revival and that no one was a really big name. Even Jeremiah Lamphere, probably none of you have heard of him, unless you heard me say him before at a certain time. I, I'm guessing. But there was another guy who, at least in Philly, he was known as a dynamic or powerful preacher God was using. His name was Dudley Ting. He uh, was a, a powerful preacher, but you know, he was only like 29 or he was... Yeah, I don't think he was even 30, but he preached the sermon, and during the sermon, he said something like this, I would rather that this right arm, his right arm, were amputated at the trunk than that I should come short of my duty to you in delivering God's message. Yeah, that's a real preacher. That's someone who's saying, like, I would rather die, lose something, and deliver God's word full than not deliver God's word fully. Right? But you know what happened the following week? He was at a farm. His shirt got caught in a corn threshing machine. And his, his arm literally almost got ripped off, and a major artery was severed. He, he bled out. Massive blood loss, and he died. Now, before he died, though, there were some friends and some other pastors even around him, I believe, at that farm at that time. And he said weekly, but he said, let's all stand for Jesus. Let's all stand for Jesus. And he had his funeral a week later. There was another pastor named George Duffield. He gave a poetic tribute to him, and it ended up becoming a hymn. And actually, uh, I was reading how that became a motto for the YMCA, but it had to do with standing up for Jesus, right? God was working in these ways throughout. Um, So many things were happening. And it wasn't just major cities, but towns and and smaller places. uh, God was working. And there were a lot of people who were lost who got saved. They focused on the conversion of souls. But again, this all happened through heartfelt prayer. And seeking the Lord in this way. And this unity that they had. So let me just read this quote as we close. Um, This comes from the book God's Eyes Vision. Which I've been looking at and sharing from in particular about different revivals historically. Uh, The author says this. The 1857-58 awakening testifies that God is not intimidated by the size of our cities. And sin found therein. His Holy Spirit can move through these cities again. God is looking for people like Jeremiah Lanfear who ask this question, Lord, what would you have me to do? He's looking for people of prayer, and he uses this prayer to bring the Christian unity that so often precedes and accompanies revival. God does these things, especially as we pray. And so I know in a Zoom prayer a couple weeks ago, someone asked, I don't even know how to pray for revival. What should we pray for? Thank God for this prayer. We're given, you know, instructions how to pray. What would happen if we did? Okay? So I want to encourage us with that. I want to continue to pray for God to revive people, revive us, his church, his people, and also revive and bring revival to those who don't know him as well. Okay, let's pray. God, um, 
I do pray that you would continue to give us a heart and, a, and the, the flame, whatever size that may be in some of our hearts, that you'd continue to fan it, that we continue to, or that our faith would continue to increase, God, as well in, in what you can do because you've done it before and you're faithful to your promises, oh God. And so whether it's just in our own life right now, maybe it's just in our family, maybe it's we have our church in mind when we pray for these things, oh Lord. Would you stir that up in each of us, we pray? And would you stir this desire to pray for revival more in each of us as well? Yeah. And may it be something that lasts. It may not be something that just goes to and fro. You know, it, it, it's like it, it passes, Lord. But rather, would you develop this greater desire within us, Lord, to seek you and to pray in these ways? So give us boldness. May we be persistent. Um, you know, may we ask for your assurance and ask for the things that Moses did as well. But Lord, as we pray these things, would you continue to work and more powerfully in our midst? We're not satisfied, God. We want to keep circling back. We need more of you in our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, in our city. The city needs more of you, God. You did it before in major cities. You could do it again, Lord. So give us that faith, and may we seek after you, we pray. So as we worship you, would you also unleash more of a spirit of prayer? We're not going to pray separately today, but Lord, may there be prayers lifted up, we ask. So we thank you in Jesus' name.